strand. It's the last teaching block of the brain and behaviour strand. The climax, if you will. And I'm so pleased you made it this far. I'm guessing that not everybody in the audience here today came to study psychology at York because they were really interested in the brain. But I'm hoping that some of you will have been interested by now. Now in this last section, we're going to try and bring together everything that you've learned up to now and also understand some new things. That's why I call it Principles of Neural Representation. Now, it's not a new idea that the brain might have something to do with the way we think. In fact, you can go right back to Hippocrates, Hippocrates in the 5th century BC, who's sometimes called the father of modern medicine, but one of the clever things he thought was that the brain had something to do with the way we think, feel, act, behave. And so he said, men ought to know that from the brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, joys, laughters and jests, as well as our sorrows, pains, griefs and fears. Through it, in particular, we see, hear and distinguish the ugly from the beautiful, the bad from the good, and the unpleasant from the pleasant. Now, we shouldn't just believe something because Hippocrates, back in the day, said it, um, but hopefully by now this brain behaviour strand has made you think that there might have been something in what he said. But let's think for just one more moment, a little bit, about what that would really mean if it were true that through the brain and through the brain only, everything we see, we feel, we understand, all the loves, hates, everything happens in our brain. Uh, do we really understand how that works? You've learned a bit about some of the pieces of how it works from this course. We've known, we've learned about uh, vision, uh, hearing, attention, uh, vision, attention, memory. We, we've covered a number of different topics and we have some idea about the brain basis of some of those things. 
But have you really thought much about what the different aspects of cognition may have in common and whether there's any general pattern there? I'm one of those kind of people that likes to believe that there is a pattern, there's a meaning there that we can find somewhere. And I think there are some patterns in, in the way that the brain works. Something that is true no matter what you're looking at, whether it's memory, vision, or so on. And I just want, on this course, to think about those general principles, whether they exist, if they exist, and how we can understand them. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about. Um, and just to sort of illustrate um, this point, I'd like to now ask to step up onto the stage. Mr. Nathan B, who's going to touch my banana. Don't do it yet, Nathan, don't touch it. Just stand there, please. Okay, so I'm going to just ask Nathan to demonstrate. I've got here two, two fruit that I'm holding in my hands, the wrong way around there. Okay, now in a moment, I'm just going to say to Nathan one word, um, and, I'm, and, and at that command, he is going to touch one of my fruit. Um, and I'd like you to watch very carefully what goes on. Banana. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Can you give him a round of applause? Please? <laughs> So, so you saw there, not necessarily the pinnacle of human achievement, but something quite remarkable. I said a word, banana. It's a sequence of, of sounds. And Nathan knew who, how to interpret that as a signal that he should reach out and touch a particular curved yellow object. He didn't make a mistake. He could have touched a round green object, which is an apple. But he decided to touch my curved yellow banana. He understood that by the word banana, and he knew how to move his hand forward. Now, all this stuff might seem pretty obvious. We've, we, you know, we've talked about much more complicated things in, in psychology, how children develop language, how people might be prejudiced. So why on earth am I talking about Nathan touching my banana now? Why I'm talking about it is because I think that if we can't understand how, in the brain, we can reach out and touch a banana... How on earth can we hope to understand how children develop language? How on earth can we hope to understand why one person is prejudiced and another person isn't? At the level of the brain, and that's what we're interested in here on brain behaviour, we're interested in really understanding how the brain makes things happen. Can, do you really understand it yet? I'm hoping that by the end of this teaching block, you'll understand a lot better. There's no neuroscientist in the world who can give you a complete and accurate explanation of how Nathan's brain works and how it allowed him, or how our brains would work when we reach out and correctly touch a banana rather than an apple. No one can do it because the full workings of that are not yet known. But we do know quite a lot. And I kind of would like you to think about those generalities that we've learned about how the brain works, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this teaching block. So to give you the aims of the teaching block, I'm just going to read out what I would consider to be what they call a learning objective. Um, which is when we're supposed to tell you what you're supposed to get out of doing this part of the course, this module, if you like. And the main aim for me is for you to be able to identify general principles that govern the way information is represented and processed in the brain. It might sound fairly dull, so if you're finding it difficult to keep a handle on that, remember the sorts of things I want you to know is what might be going on in the brain when somebody touches a banana. That will help keep it concrete. But really, what I'm trying to do is give you some knowledge and understanding about how the brain works. I hope that by the end of this, you'll know and understand something more than what you currently do about how the brain works and how it supports a simple action like touching a banana. What my learning objective is not for everybody in this room to get the top mark in the exam. I haven't mentioned the exam on this slide. If you listen carefully to the lectures and you think carefully about what I'm saying, I truly, truly hope that everybody in this room will understand more about how the brain works and will achieve this goal of identifying these general principles. And if you do that, I think there's a good chance you'll get a great mark in the exam. I already set the questions and I can't do anything about them now, so if by accident I let you know what the answers are, you'll probably do quite well. However, that's not my goal. My goal is for you to understand it, and your goal should be to understand it as well. It's not really about just figuring out the few things that you'll need to answer those 20 questions that will be on the exam at the end. I will answer those kind of questions, but I think if you're focused too much on that little thing, then you won't see the big picture, and it's really the big picture that I'm trying to get across here. And in this teaching block, 
I'm going to try to draw together some of the specific topics that you've learned about earlier on. So I mentioned vision, memory, attention, and so forth earlier on. And in each case, you might know something about how neurons or how the brain performs that particular part of cognition. But you maybe haven't seen the generalities that I'm going to try and pick out and draw out. So what you might find is that you kind of have heard some of the things I'm going to say to you today and tomorrow, uh, sorry, today and next week. Um, you may feel that some of them are familiar. That's good. That's the idea. You're supposed to be seeing how ooh, there's the same pattern here, here and here, and there's a general principle. And it's the general principles we're, we're really trying to spell out. And to help with this story, um, I'm going to start from the very small parts of the brain, uh, the neurons, the individual cells, and what they do in various different aspects of cognition. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then in subsequent weeks, and I haven't quite yet figured out exactly how this is going to work, but in subsequent weeks we're going to talk about larger groups of neurons, populations of neurons, up until whole brain areas and maps of function in the brain. Okay? And I want to try and say that at each of these different spatial scales we can identify some general principles that are at work. So now I'm just going to introduce what we're going to do in this lecture. I'm going to tell you pretty much what I'm going to say in the next part. And before I do that, I just want to point out, um, it's really great that so many of you have turned up today to actually be here in person, because some people might think, well, you can just listen to class capture. But um, I want you to pay very close attention now to what I'm writing on the board. Can everybody see it? So I hope that you can see from what I've written there that there is a very important reason to show up to the lecture. But if you are listening to this on class capture, I can reassure you that all I've written on the board is people who uh, only listen to class capture might miss some things. And I guess the point is, actually what you'll be missing is the chance to ask a question or to think more deeply about it while I'm talking to you. So I really appreciate that you've all shown up today. and It's, it's a big boost, actually. It's, I, I, love, I love to see an, a humongous heaving crowd of uh, enthusiastic and excited students looking at me when I'm talking. It, it excites me. So um, okay, so to, to, I digress a little there. Uh, what I wanted to say really is um, how is information represented in an individual neuron? That's what we're going to talk about today in lecture one. And I'm going to say that the neuron fires when a particular set of conditions are met, and those conditions are determined by the inputs to that neuron. And I want to make the analogy at this stage that the neuron is a bit like a detector, something like a smoke detector. And you may think, well, that's not a great analogy, there might be some problems with it. If you were thinking something like that, that would be a good thing, because that's kind of critical thinking. Um, that's something that we look for in degree courses, and we're, we're happy if you're thinking those kind of things. You might think that the neuron is not like a detector. And next week we'll talk about the limitations of that, and I'll come on to it a little bit later in this lecture. But it is a bit like a, uh, a detector. And I want to think a little bit more about how the varying firing rates of neurons might serve to represent percepts, concepts, and actions. Actually, what I should say here is, is things or, or stuff, because I couldn't find a good word for all of the things that have to be represented or processed in our brain. There don't seem to be very good general words for those things. So percepts, concepts, and actions will have to cover it for the moment. By percepts, I, of course, mean things in the outside world, uh, your perception of things in the outside world. By actions, I obviously mean your, your action, your responses towards such stimuli. Uh, but by concepts, I really mean pretty much everything that happens in between the stimuli that you encounter and your decision uh, and intention to act. Um, so I want to ask, really, where, can we see similar principles at work in all of these different kinds of representation? Can we see similar principles at work in sensory, motor, and cognitive neurons? I use the term loosely because I'm really talking about any neuron that represents something that isn't it's clearly linked to a stimulus or a response. Anything else, in other words. And then I want to come on to what are the limits of the detector analogy. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about it today, and then I want to talk about it some more next time. And I think by then I will have decided what I want to say. So this first slide now 
Um, should be revision for everybody, so don't be distressed if you think this is a little patronising. I know that you got this probably in week one of the whole course, so you may be a bit rusty on it now, but pretty much everybody will be fully familiar with it. You should be familiar with it because it's kind of, this is the essential knowledge that you need to understand the rest of this lecture. And I think in next week's lecture I have another couple of slides a bit like this that you'll, you'll also probably know already, but will help you. So, neurons are, are cells which are specialised for receiving and propagating signals, and they receive chemical signals in these branching structures called dendrites. And those signals can be converted into an electrical, electrical impulse called an action potential, or spike, which is propagated throughout the cell, and especially along this extended process, which is called an axon. And the axon will then make contact with other neurons um, so that the signal can be passed from one neuron to the next. So all that should be fairly familiar with you. You might need to know in this lecture a little bit more about what I mean by an action <coughs> potential. And of course, you should remember that from earlier on in the course, but it's a good thing. Uh, action potentials, knowing the properties of action potentials is probably a good thing to know about for this part of the course too. So as I've said, I'm going to argue that the neuron, an individual neuron, can be thought of as a detector in that it integrates information from a variety of different sources and then it sends a signal reflecting the degree to which its inputs match some kind of pattern. So if you think about the smoke detector that you should have in your house, do check your smoke detector when you get home, it's important for safety reasons. Um, you should have a smoke detector in your house, and, and when there's smoke in the house, even though you may not have smelt it or seen it, the smoke detector beeps, and through the beeps you become aware that the, uh, the smoke is in your house. So in a sense, the beeping tells you that smoke is there. And in a similar way, uh, the firing of a neuron might tell other neurons that something is out there, or that some action is intended, or some concept is being accessed or processed. It's quite a vague uh, metaphor, and if you're of a philosophical bent, you might think, hang on, that doesn't get the whole story. That's fine, but this is the analogy I want to indulge in today, and we'll see how far we can get with it and whether there are any problems. Okay, so if we think about, for a moment, about Nathan's brain as he was faced with that difficult problem just now of choosing, of, of, of acting on these fruit, um, we might imagine that there was a, a, a neuron in his brain, the banana, a hypothetical banana detector. I don't know if there actually are banana detectors in, in the brain, but it's very plausible there might be. Um, this banana is a neuron which receives input from a bunch of other neurons. Um, those other neurons might represent properties of a banana or of any other fruit. So here we have a, a curved, a representation of curved. This neuron fires when there's a curved thing. This neuron fires when there's a yellow thing. This neuron fires when there's a round thing. This neuron fires when there's a green thing. This one fires when there's a red thing. Um, and hopefully this one will fire when there's a banana. So the question is, um, something you can start thinking about now, is how, which signals would we want to get through to this neuron if it was to fire to a banana? It's not rocket science. Some of those connections would need to be strong excitatory connections in order that the banana could be detected. And other ones would need to be very weak or even inhibitory to stop Nathan reaching out and touching my apple. So which of those, does anybody want to say which of those connections ought to be weak or inhibitory? It's very easy, so you should, somebody should be willing to answer that question. Would it be the yellow? No, because <laughs> bananas are yellow. Would it be the curved? No, it would be the round and the green, right? Okay. It, it does seem easy, and the reason why I'm making it deliberately seem overly easy is because, in fact, the way that these neural networks might be wired up is not as complicated as it might seem when you see complicated books about neural networks and the way they're connected together. Some of these connections will need to be strong, and they're the ones that represent the property, from neurons representing the properties the banana actually has. And that's something that we're going to come on to later in the course. But we can imagine a banana detector is, is integrating information from these different sources and getting ready to send out a signal when these precise conditions, curved and yellow, are met. That's all I want to say about this silly example for the moment. So as I say, the individual neuron can be thought of as representing the thing it detects. 
And in principle, that could be a very complicated and hard to describe pattern of inputs from lots of neurons. But in practice, it might be possible to determine a very small number of factors that influence the firing rate of a neuron and describe the thing it represents. So experiments that investigate the uh, representation in individual neurons often use this technique, which is called extracellular single unit recording. And in extracellular single unit recording, or single unit recording, um, an animal has an implanted electrode in their brain. A metal electrode is implanted in the brain, and, it, and the tip of the metal electrode, is, which is very tiny, this says 14, 14 micrometers, this tiny metal tip is near to some neurons and obviously not near to very many others. So it records the electrical activity from the, the neurons which are near to the tip. And um, in that way, uh, one can see whether a particular neuron is firing or not, and how, much, how often it's firing, when the spikes are fired, and so forth. And you can read more about this, in, I think, in this book here. Now, something you might remember from earlier on in the course is something about action potentials. We're really interested in action potentials here, but when I say the cell is firing, I'm talking about action potentials being generated. Um, now, here's, a, here's a, um, a recording of the membrane potential of a neuron over time as various amounts of current are applied across the membrane potential. And at some point, um, this threshold is breached, and then an action potential is generated. And what you should already know, what you should remember from earlier before in the course, is that all of the action potentials are going to have roughly the same height or amplitude, so that the strength of each individual spike doesn't carry any information. So the size or amplitude of the spike is not, ca is not telling us very much. They're all the same height. <coughs> So what that means is that if we're going to analyse what an, uh, an individual neuron is signalling, then we need to focus on the, on the rate of firing and on the timing of the individual action potential. So here's a way that um, information about uh, spikes and neurons, spikes from a given neuron is often displayed. At the top you can see uh, a bunch of uh, rows of dots um, here along this, the x-axis is time, and you can see that the stimulus begins at this time here, which is marked as zero. So a visual stimulus is coming on at time zero. And there at the top, you can see these dots. Um, each one of the rows represents a different trial on which the stimulus was presented. And you can see the dots represent times at which an action potential was fired. So you can see, hopefully looking at that diagram, that when the visual stimulus comes on, after a short period of time, there's an increase in the number of spikes that this cell fires, not just on one trial, but on a whole bunch of trials. And um, you'll see some more examples of um, this type of plot in your tutorial, if you haven't already done the tutorial. Now, down at the bottom of this plot is another way of representing the same information, this time uh, counting up the number of spikes in each window of time, in each short window of time. So this peristimulus histogram indicates how many spikes are being fired in a given period of time, or if you like, the spike rate or firing rate of the cell. And what you can see is when the stimulus comes on, the firing rate increases. So you might say the information about the stimulus is being carried in the firing rate of the cell. So information about the stimulus is being carried in the rate at which the cell fires, and that is called rate coding. And some neural codes, which we won't talk much about on this course, but some other neural codes also use the precise timing of the individual spikes. Uh, and that's called temporal coding. So you might so functions that use the timing of the spikes include things like sound localization, where the precise diff delay between the sound getting to one ear and the other ear tells you something about where the sound came from. And neurons can be sensitive to those timing differences and can encode them. But most of the neurons we're going to consider, in fact, I think all of the neurons we'll think about today and for the rest of this course, are going to be using spike, uh, you're going to be using rate coding. And we're interested in the way that the firing rate uh, might represent different types of information or help to process different types of information.
Okay, so now I'd like to show you a video example of a particular very well-known experiment that you'll probably know about from, uh, from vision lectures earlier on in the course. This was work done by um, Hubel and Wiesel, who were awarded the Nobel Prize for their work, um, uncovering the, the, the nature of the representation uh, in the uh, visual cortex. Um, and in these kinds of experiments, in this experiment, a, a, a cat is be, uh, has a, an electrode implanted in its brain while it's being um, shown uh, images on the screen. I'm going to show you a video of this, um, and I'd like you to watch it carefully. We'll talk about, about it a little bit more in a moment. So what you can see is the stimulus being shown on the screen, and that sound you can hear, each click is the sound of an action potential being recorded from a particular cell in visual cortex. And the experimenter here is trying to figure out what makes the cell fire. It doesn't always fire. So he's figured out roughly where the stimulus has to be to make the cell fire and not fire. Let's just check that. Now if the line's oriented in a different direction, it doesn't work. But it works pretty well when it's close to the desired orientation. Moving away, not so well. So as the slope of the stimulus changes on the screen, it affects the firing rate of the cell. So it matters where the stimulus is in the visual field, and it matters the orientation of the line. OK, so that is how researchers began to figure out the receptive fields of the neurons in visual cortex. And I expect that you've been told quite a lot about these neurons in the early part of the course on vision. Um, and I want to think a little bit more about how that cell works and what it might have in common with other kinds of neuron that I'll tell you about shortly. Okay, so we notice that the cell responds to a particular combination of stimulus properties. There might be more than the ones I'm going to tell you about now, because if you investigate the neurons more carefully, you might find other things that make the cell fire more or less. But in particular, this stimulus has to be in a particular part of the visual field, and it has to, be, it has to have a contrasting edge which is orientated in a particular direction. So here's the uh, stimulus that's uh, at the correct location, and now the orientation of the stimulus is being changed gradually in this experiment. And here is a, is a, is a count of the responses that are made um, as time goes by. And what you can see is that for this uh, idealised cell, um, a, a stimulus that a vertical bar makes that cell fire more. So there are more spikes when the cell is vertical, and somewhat fewer when it's orientated at a slight slant to the vertical, um, and then none if it's horizontal in this instance. So another way of showing that very same data would be to plot this tuning curve down here. So on the, on the x-axis here, we have the stimulus orientation, and on the y-axis, we have the firing rate of the neuron. So you call that an, a tuning curve, and you've probably learned about them before as in this context of receptive fields of of sensory neurons. So when investigated in detail, the response to a given property is often found to be graded in this way. So they often, neurons often have this bell-shaped tuning curve, so that there's a peak value which elicits the highest firing rate, and then there are um, either side 
of that peak value, there's a range in which the cell will also respond somewhat less vigorously. So, as I said, for sensory neurons, we can think about these as being properties of the receptive field. But what I want to point out today, and what you perhaps haven't thought about before much, is that the concept of these neural tunings is not restricted to sensory information. I'm going to give you some examples now of other types of cell, some of which you may have not heard before, and you should try and understand the particular examples I'm giving you because um, they will help to illustrate the general principles that I'm after here. So on the left, I've got sensory cells. On the right, I've got motor cells, that's cells involved in generating a particular kind of response. And you'll be learning about these, if you haven't done already, in the tutorial. And so you'll, if you don't already know about them, you're going to know much more by the end of this week. In the middle, I've put cognitive neurons, by which I mean, as I've said before, neurons which are firing towards properties that are not clearly linked to either the stimulus or to the response. But in each case, we can find categories of neuron that show these bell-shaped curves. Okay, so here's an example of a bell-shaped curve from the kind of V1 cell that you just heard about now. So I won't explain any more about that one. It's a cell that responds to a bar in a particular orientation, in a particular part of the visual field, and that's a cell in area V1. Um, but here is a bell-shaped curve in a very different um, kind of cell, which most of you will not have heard before. It's called a head direction cell, and it's found in the post subiculum, which is part of the hippocampal formation, and this is a, in, in the rat, actually. So these experiments have been done in rats. This cell works a little bit like a compass. So um, the cell fires most strongly when the animal is heading in a particular direction, that is, when it's either facing or moving in a particular direction. When you're talking about a rat, facing, face, they don't really have their face as such, but they're heading in a certain direction, and it's the heading that they're heading in that's indicated by the firing rate of this cell. Now you need to be quite clear on that. Okay, so head direction refers to a compass direction, if you like, which produces the firing rate. This, the preferred value of this cell corresponds to a head direction of roughly about 270 degrees. That's a particular heading in the laboratory. Whenever the animal is running in this direction, the cell fires more strongly. If it's running in this direction, not at all. If it's running in this direction, a bit. Okay, so that's a head direction cell. Um, a good way to think about it is <clears throat> to imagine that in the room here we've got two different head direction cells. I'm going to ask you to do a bit of audience participation now. Are you ready for it? Um, if we divide you into half about here, i like you to imagine that this half of the room, you're a head direction cell that's tuned to this compass direction. Okay. This other half of the room, you're a head direction cell that's tuned to this compass direction, i.e. towards the door. But it will be the same if I'm going over here. So it's that compass direction. I'm going to move about, and I would like you to clap to indicate uh, action potentials. Okay, so I should, so, and this will also help my colleagues to think that I'm giving a fantastic lecture. <laughs> but first of all, so, so um, now I'm, I'm going to start moving about, and I'd just like everybody in the room to clap, and I head in the appropriate direction. Do you know which the direction is? It's that way. And you guys know that way, okay? Ready? I'm going to start. Ah, the other side, I'm going towards the door now. So you... Okay, I think that demonstrates it. It's quite clear, and now you understand how a head direction cell works. I guess there's one other thing I should do. Yes, what's the question? I don't know if rats can run backwards, is that regardless of which way they're running? They, run they can't, forward. I think they run forwards. It's the way their, their head is pointing. Um, interesting question. I'm go just going to do one more demonstration of this. Uh, so I want you to keep clapping it, uh, as you did before. Okay, just to illustrate one. Uh, you keep going. Keep going. Well, See, the thing is, I'm now heading in this way, so I should still be getting a massive clap. Yeah. And now I'm heading in this direction. It doesn't matter where I am in the room, 
The same thing applies because this cell only cares about the direction I'm heading, not where I am, the compass direction. Does everybody think they understand what a head direction cell does now? Yes. You might have one that fires when I'm going north, another one that fires when I'm going south. And it might lose its thread at some time, so it might gradually go off. It fires north one day, the next day maybe northeast, something like that. Yes? Is it only when you're moving, or is it...? No, it, it's, it's also, it can be when you're stationary or not moving very fast, but it, I think it fires more strongly when you're moving. That's quite a technical point, and there's a danger I might make a mistake if I get into that kind of issue. Okay, so that's... Now, why do I call that a cognitive cell, if you like, and not a sensory cell? The reason I think that we can say it's cognitive is because I, nothing I'm sensing can directly tell me which compass direction I'm heading. It's been computed on the basis of lots of different information, information about my movements, what I'm seeing in the world. But, my, but what I see when I'm facing that way from here is very different from what I'll see when I'm facing in the same direction from over there. So it's not something that's directly tied to, this, to the stimulus, if you will, or to my action. <coughs> it actually corresponds to some, something in between. And I'm going to tell you about another kind of cell which has this characteristic in a moment. Um, the next type of cell I want to tell you about is, the, is a motor, motor cell and that is covered in some detail in the tutorial. Okay, so everybody will know more about how these work later. But if we think about an individual uh, upper motor neuron, that's a neuron in the primary motor cortex. Um, this and the characteristic property of these neurons is that they fire before the arm is being or a limb is moved in a particular direction relative to its starting point. So. If my hand is here and I move it forwards, that would be driven by a whole set of upper, neuro, upper motor neurons firing. And there are some neurons which will fire very strongly when I'm moving in that particular direction, which would be its preferred direction. And other neurons will fire more strongly when I'm moving in this direction. Okay, so I'm not going to make you do... Well, you could do it, but you need to be quite coordinated because you are now the brain. I can't tell you what to do. But say you want to make my hand work... If people on one side clap, I'll move it that way, and people on that side clap, I'll move it that way. But if you don't coordinate it, then I won't know what to do, and I'll have to just move it forwards. Okay, so you've got the idea. Um, that would be kind of how it works. Now, you notice that I couldn't make the movement until you guys started to clap, because it's a motor neuron. The brain is telling the body what to do. It's not about the stimulus coming in from the outside world. It's about the brain generating a response outward. So it's very different character to the sensory neurons, but it still has this bell-shaped tuning curve. That's what I want to emphasize. Um, and the firing rate of the neurons is communicating the direction that the movement will be made in. So that will be an individual neuron. And one of the things... Uh, well, I'll just... I'll leave this point and I'll come back to this. There's some question about what I would do if you just clapped a little bit, right? How, which direction? If the firing rate is at this level, which direction should I move in? Because there's more than one way that that could be consistent with. The answer is, it doesn't just matter what one neuron does. Okay, we'll come on to that later and next week. So just to be clear on this slide, which I think is a key slide and an interesting slide, is you need to notice that there's a bell-shaped curve in each case, and that the things that are being coded are very, very different in each case. Okay, here we've got the direction that I'm heading in, here we've got the direction that a limb is going to be moved in, a very different kind of direction, if you like, and here we've got the orientation um, of a line, uh, a, a stimulus. If you have any questions about that, there'll be a break at, and you can raise the questions then. Okay, but what I want to make is that the same neuron is tuned to respond to preferred values on multiple stimulus dimensions. So, for example, in the case of the V1 cells, it could care about where the stimulus was in the visual field, but it could also care about the orientation of that stimulus. So it wasn't just one thing that it was interested in. It was a combination of different factors that makes the cell fire. What, we don't always know what the key stimulus dimensions are. We don't know in advance when we find a new neuron what's going to make it work. Okay, so we don't know what the dimensions are or what shape the tuning curves have. 
that's something that the neuroscientists have to find out, and they're still learning about parts of the brain now. And so that's one of the many unknowns that we're investigating. Neuroscientists are trying to figure out how this works in different parts of the brain. So although I'm talking about general principles today, they're only the general principles that we've been able to piece together from the patterns amongst neurons that have been studied so far. And, you know, they may not be the whole story. Um, so I want to talk just a, a little bit about some other cells, um, some other types of neurons, to, to, to show you how this idea of a bell-shaped tuning curve might extend to more than one stimulus dimension. In each case here, these, uh, in the cases on the left, each of the stimulus dimensions are dimensions that you'll readily understand from your own experience, um, less so the one on the right. But again, we have sensory over here, uh, cognitive in the middle, and um, another kind of sensory neuron, in fact, over here. So um, let's talk about this one first. This is an example of the tuning curve of a head-centered receptive field cell. This is in the, uh, this is in the ventral intraparietal cortex of a monkey. Now, a characteristic of this type of cell is that it does respond to a stimulus in the outside world, a bit like the V1 cells, but rather than caring about where it is relative to the animal's eye, it cares about where the stimulus is relative to the animal's head. That means that if the animal turns its head, the stimulus doesn't generate a response, but if the animal moves its eye, it continues to generate a response. Okay, so wherever I'm looking, the cell's going to keep firing. I don't think I'm going to make you the, the action potentials for that one, but there's a particular area, place, rel relative to my head, that is the receptive field of this neuron. Okay, when my head moves, the receptive field moves. So it's a different kind of cell again. But once again, curved. And I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that it's not just curved in one dimension, in the X dimension, it's also <coughs> curved in the other dimension, in the Y dimension. So this bell shape is a 2D curve. It could be any number of dimensions, really. This one might make it a bit easier to understand, and it's an important type of cell that you should know about, which is a cell um, which I'm very enthusiastic about. Um, it's, it's a cell that's found in the hippocampus, a part of the brain that's important for memory, but also for finding your way around in the world. And a characteristic of these cells when they're studied in rats is that the cell fires when you're in a particular place Okay, so there might be a place, let's say over there, where this cell is going to fire. Now it won't be firing now because I'm standing here and it's far away from, from the place field. But when I go over there, I would like you to, to do the action potentials now. Okay? <laughs> Not so much because I'm moving away, you see. I'm going to go back there just to, just to emphasise it. Okay, so you get the picture. Now that place, again, it's not something that's easily defined in terms of what I'm seeing. I could be moving that way, I could be moving that way. Whenever I am in that location, the cell fires. Lots of experiments have been done to show what does and doesn't influence the firing of that cell. But pretty much they fire at a particular place. It's not due to a particular stimulus or a particular configuration of stimulus. It's to do with where you are. Okay, so that's a place cell. Yes? So I don't quite understand that. Is there a place beyond every place you can be? Um, it's each range and environment you're in, or what? Okay, it's, it's a complex question, but I'll answer it. it the, uh, the answer is that a subset of place cells will fire in any environment. So in this environment, if I was a rat, and I was able to record from 100 rat place cells, some of them would fire in this room, and each of them would probably fire at a different place. Together, the 30 or 40 cells that I could record from would span the whole environment. If I moved into a different environment, such as C003, a proportion of those cells would fire in that environment, maybe at different locations, and some new cells will start to fire. So the overall pattern of firing is, helps to determine which, which room I'm in, and the cells themselves can tell you where you are within a room. So do you generate new place cells for every new place you go to? Um, as far as we can tell, the place cells start to be active as soon as you go into a new environment. So the same, uh, 
the same cell might be active in more than one environment, but it will show that pattern as soon as you're in it. Yeah, it's interesting to wonder how they work, and one, one guess is that they might, be, they might be sensitive, at least in part, to the distances from the walls that define the place that you are. So, in, so if I'm moving around in this environment, um, when I get over there, I'm very close to those two walls over there, so perhaps that's the defining feature. Um, but I shouldn't get too much in, because I will talk about play cells all day long, if you encourage me. So we'll talk about that more later as well next week. The last kind of cell that I want to talk about on this slide is another kind of um, higher level visual cell, particularly relevant to the problem of the banana. We're going to talk about this cell again next week. But what I want to talk to tell you about is the, is the tuning curve of this neuron, which is in area V4. Um, it's actually recorded in a monkey's brain when the monkey's looking at lots of different shapes. And, for, and, and we're going to talk about that, this in much more detail next week. But on this axis here, we've got position around the edge of the fruit, angular position. So this is straight up, this is uh, left, this is right, and so forth. We can take the angular position. That's what's on this axis. And curvature is on the other axis. So this is pointy, that's high. Uh, this is not very pointy, this is concave. That's very low. This is convex, so slightly pointy. That's up here somewhere. Okay, so a given neuron in area V4 of the monkey's cortex will encode a particular uh, degree of curvature and a particular combination of curvature and angular position. So uh, this particular cell would... F <laughs> I, I, maybe I'll get you to do clapping in a minute, but this particular cell will, will fire strongly when the banana is in this configuration because a pointy part of the banana is pointing straight upwards which is indicated by the 90 degrees so that's giving a very strong stimulus to this V4 neuron if I rotate it like that no, it's going to fire very weakly now because it, it, instead of being a pointy part it's, a, it's actually a concave part now as I bring it around a bit more that will fire more because this is quite pointy and somewhat less and then less okay, so that neuron is encoding an aspect of the shape of an object. And we'll talk about that more next week and how we could actually figure out the shape of the object from these neurons. Okay, so it's about time that we had a very short break. Um, would you like to watch the video before or after the break? Okay, so we'll watch this video first, which is a YouTube video. Um, it's some, some minutes long, but it's quite interesting. And then there will be a short break after which we'll discuss some of the issues that come up in it. It's nine minutes long. I think the whole thing's interesting. Okay. <laughs> study was done in, in a group of uh, neurosurgical patients uh, undergoing brain surgery uh, for severe uh, intractable epilepsy that cannot be treated successfully with medications. And the key challenge in this patient is to identify an area in the brain where potentially the seizures are coming from. So that later this area can be resected in surgery with a high probability of uh, cure. Uh, now the way this is done is that the patient undergo an uh, implantation of specific electrodes that are placed in the brain in particular targets uh, which are suspected to be the origin of the, uh, 
the seizures. And they sit essentially on a ward in a hospital for several days awaiting the, a seizure to occur. This is a very unique opportunity to be able to record not just the EG, but actually the, the firing of individual nerve cells. We can listen in on the conversation that neurons have with, with each other. So we try to make the most of this incredible rare opportunity by asking the patient to play a simple video game in which they can use their thoughts to control what they see on a computer monitor in front of them. We have seen in the past that there are particular brain cells which are able to represent information in a very abstract uh, fashion, meaning that if you have got some stimulus in the environment impinging on the retina, by the time it comes to our nerve cells in the medial temporal lobe, it is encoded in an abstract fashion, meaning that if you are thinking now of Marilyn Monroe, that particular neuron in your brain and probably a group of other neurons like this particular neurons they come to life with a particular memory or even the imagery of a Merlin Monroe. project we wanted to see how speedily and selectively people can modulate these, uh, the neural activity of these neurons in their own head. Moran Cerf developed a fancy feedback technique that allows him to visualize the firing activity of four more neurons in a patient's head using a movie. The way he does it is that he finds one neuron that re uh, responds selectively much more strongly, let's say, to Marilyn Monroe than to images of Josh Brolin. And you find a, a second neon that responds much more to Josh Bowen than to images of Marilyn Monroe. We wanted to, to see how the, the patient in their own mind can really summon up one thought uh, on the expense perhaps of another thought. And that was done in, in, a, in a way that the particular thought that they had uh, could be uh, depicted on a, a screen. So the, the paradigm essentially starts with a fusion or a hybrid of two different uh, concepts, let's say Marilyn Monroe and Josh Brolin. Uh, so you essentially start with, with the hybrid and then by uh, controlling your thought process you can in a sense change the balance between those uh, two representations. Now on the screen you basically can very quickly learn how to uh, bring in one image on the expense of another. The stronger the Josh Brolin neuron fires, the more you see the image of Josh Brolin and the more the image of the Marilyn Monroe will fade. So it's a, it's a competition. If the patient attends more to Marilyn Monroe, the Marilyn Monroe neurons will hopefully fire stronger and will enhance each movie's unique function of the firing rate of, uh, of these neurons. Each neuron really expresses how well, how quickly, how strongly patients can control their neurons using nothing but their thoughts in a conscious manner. The patient would then, in, in his or her own mind, create a situation where those neurons responsible for Marilyn Monroe would essentially take over the neurons which are responsible for Josh Brolin, meaning not only that the neurons of Marilyn Monroe would suddenly come to life actively, but those other neurons representing Josh Brolin would simply go down in their activity or essentially be inhibited. Incidentally, this research also answers the questions of how do you suppress, how do you not think of a white elephant? Well, the answer is you do that by partly, partially suppressing the responses of the neurons that encode the white elephant.
they were remarkable observations. They sit in bed and they didn't know anything about this thing. They didn't know that they can access their neurons a minute before we started, but now they get direct access to the neurons in their brain. They sit there and they're kind of fascinated by the ability to move things on the screen voluntarily, just by pure thought. So one of the remarkable results of the paper is that there are situations that patients actually see on the screen one thing, but are told to think of something else. So they see a picture of a spider on the screen almost entirely, but we told them your target is very cool, so think of her. And they're able to win the trial by thinking of Mel on the wall and overriding the visual input. So they, their eyes see a spider, but their mind thinks Mel on the wall. And those two concepts are kind of competing inside their brain. But because the mind is stronger than the, the vision, they're somehow able to override this vision and win the trial by making the picture of Mel on the wall appear on the screen. The, the, the environment offers a lot of information to us, and it's all kind of being read by our senses, when we see things, we smell things, when we listen to things, they all get into our brain. But we choose what to attend to. So this in a sense brings the question is who is really in control? Do we control our neurons or do our neurons control us? Well, of course the solution may be that we ourselves are our own neurons. But that uh, study essentially manifested uh, our ability to override the sensory input by a voluntary process. What our results clearly show is that at least in these structures, particularly in the hippocampus, in the parahippocampal cortex, thought overrides external realities. Here at least idealism comes realism. Uh, there the may be in the future a ability to develop brain-machine interfaces which are based on human thought, on human intention, on, on human imagery, on human memory or even on human dreams. I hope that was interesting and I would like to identify some of the key points after we have a short break but if everybody could get back here for quarter past three and then I will start again okay and we can talk a little bit more about that video. It's just five minutes.
Strand. It's so good to be here and to be talking about what individual neurons do and how they represent information in the brain. Um, so we just, before the break, we looked at a, a video of, um, of single unit recording, but not this time in animals. Uh, the key things that I want to draw your attention to is that those studies took place in human beings. Again, they were using electrodes to record the activity of single neurons in the brain, but not this time in an animal, but this time in a human being. The human beings in question, as you probably remember from that video, 
are patients who've had epilepsy, and the epilepsy is not responding to drugs, so they need surgery to stop them from having these debilitating fits. But the big problem with that is, how do you figure out which part of the brain to operate on? If you've got the wrong part, it could be disastrous. So one way that they can do it is by implanting electrodes in the brain. And while the electrodes are in place, they're able, with special electrodes, to record the activity of single units in this particular part of the brain, the medial temporal lobe. It's where the hippocampus is. Um, it's where the parahippocampal cortex is. Um, so those are the, really the key things from that video. And it was a rather unusual experiment, actually, that they were doing there, where people were actually using this information that was coming from their neurons um, and controlling it to try and make one or other picture appear. And there was a sense that the... the uh, participants were able to control the image that was on the screen by means of their thoughts. And so, uh, to connect this with the, uh, with the tutorial that we're talking about, there may be some scope in the future to use these methods of uh, understanding how neurons work to connect the brain to the outside world uh, more directly to machines, so to control computers, or uh, to control prosthetic limbs, and that's going to come up a little bit in your in your tutorial if you haven't already had it. I mean, obviously, you probably wouldn't want to have uh, electrodes implanted in your medial temporal lobe unless there was a very good reason. But our understanding of how these individual neurons work can contribute to a decoding process, so that we understand what the brain is saying or what the brain is indicating by the firing of the different neurons. So. That was a slightly unusual example, but some good and interesting background, and I will try to put the link to the YouTube page on the VLE if you want to watch it again. I think the most important part of that video, or the most interesting part, is the first part of the video where they describe the basic method of recording in human beings. Um, now I want to turn to the limits of this detector analogy. Maybe it isn't such a good idea to think about an individual neuron as being a detector. What are the limitations of this idea? I'm going to look at two issues. Does the uh, detector idea seem to require a unique neuron for every conceivable percept, concept, or action? Every conceivable concept seems like a, an oxymoron or tautology or something, but do we need one neuron for every distinct thing that we might need to think about? If so, is it a viable hypothesis? That's point number one. Uh, point number two is... How do we interpret the ambiguity in the firing rate of the neurons? I want to try and make clear that there is some uh, ambiguity in the firing of an individual neuron. So unlike a smoke detector, which goes off when there's smoke in your house, it pretty much means there's smoke in your house when it goes off. It doesn't make any noise uh, when there's no smoke in your house. So there's no uh, ambiguity there. But with a neuron, it goes off when, there's not, um, the, when the preferred value is not entirely met. Um, and what are the implications? That it, it fires to some extent, even when the preferred value is not being uh, experienced or the preferred action is not being emitted. Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. So you should, you probably will already know about this idea, but at various times psychologists, neuroscientists and philosophers have kind of entertained the idea that the brain might have separate neurons a separate neuron to represent every different uh, concept or object that you might think of. And they call this the grandmother cell. So the idea is you might have a neuron that fires whenever you think about or see your grandmother. Um, but obviously it's not just your grandmother. It, it could be any other concept that you might think of. You would therefore need another unique individual neuron to act as its detector. Otherwise, how can you detect everything that you can detect? Um, we're going to come on to ways in which you might do without the grandmother cell in some more detail next week. This, by the way, is my grandmother as a teenager. I'm very, I've found this picture lately, so I couldn't resist putting it um, onto my slide. And Maybe my dad will watch the lecture video. Um, but uh, anyway, this is my grandmother. I never saw her looking like this. She's a teenager in this picture. But I know it's my grandmother, so if I have a grandmother cell, it should be firing now, even though um, I didn't see it like this. So, um, Are there such things as grandmother cells in the brain? Well, you may have heard of these cells. It, it's not very clear in this picture, but these, this is a figure from this paper by Quiroga and colleagues, um, including uh, Koch and Freed, who you just heard in the last uh, video segment, 
the same research group who are recording from individual neurons in the brains of human participants, patients with epilepsy. So these are cells in the, uh, in the um, medial temporal lobes um, that respond specifically, in this case, to pictures of, of the actress uh, and former cast member of the sitcom uh, Friends, Jennifer Aniston. Um, the cell seems to fire strongly whenever Jennifer Aniston comes up, and it doesn't fire to similar-looking pictures of other famous actresses. This is Julia Roberts. Um, or indeed to other complex visual stimuli like these places or this spider. The cell seems to respond very selectively to all the different pictures of Jennifer Aniston and not very much at all to any of the other pictures. So we might think of these as Jennifer Aniston cells and they look rather like the fabled grandmother cells. So are they really grandmother cells or not? Okay, well, I'm going to show you another video from a similar cell. Again, it's from the same group, um, which includes Itzhak Fried, who you saw in the last video. This one is about um, looking at um, how individual neurons might play a role in memory. And I just think um, it's kind of a very interesting thing that you should know about. Where is my video? So um, i show it to you, and we'll, we'll think about... Uh, what it might mean at the end. Welcome to Hollywood! And everybody comes to Hollywood got a dream. Okay, so just before, we, just before I play it, again you're hearing the clicks, which correspond to the individual action potentials from a single neuron recorded in the medial temporal lobe of a patient with intractable epilepsy who's got these electrodes implanted. And the patient is looking at some pictures, and you're seeing the same pictures that they're looking at, and the um, graph here is going to show you the firing rate of the neuron and your task, uh, should you wish to accept it, is to try and figure out what makes the neuron fire. Stock Exchange, the world's largest and surprisingly one of the For most of the world, this is a symbol of Egypt. So not much firing for Martin Luther King or the pyramids. Not much for sex in the city. Not even Marilyn Monroe this time. Nothing much happening. Nothing for Titanic. What do you think's coming up? So from that short clip, you might think, oh, there's a neuron that's very sensitive to the symptoms. It didn't seem to respond to some other very complicated moving images. Um, if you're a good scientist, most of you probably in this room are, then you'd be thinking, well, I'm not sure if I believe that because there are lots of other uncontrolled aspects to the stimulus that could be causing it. Those Simpsons clips seem very colourful. They were maybe moving a bit faster. Um, there could be all kinds of things that were different between the Simpsons and the other and the other clips that could be driving the cell to fire. It might not necessarily be the Simpsons. But nonetheless, it's intriguing to see that a cell fires so selectively and it's in the human brain. Okay, but what's more intriguing is what they go on to show next. And I need to ex ex I'll just explain this first and we'll watch it. Now in this next clip, you hear the patient recounting what they've just seen on the video clip. Okay, and you will see their words translated at the top because voice disguise has been used to protect their identity. So you can't hear their voice very clearly. But they'll be saying Martin Luther King, the Hollywood sign, etc., etc. And at some stage, you know, they might mention, you know, what they might mention. So let's have a look and see what happens.
Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was really only one one cell on one trial in a human being, so it shouldn't necessarily change the whole way you think about the brain. But nonetheless, it's quite a compelling example of how it appears that a neuron that was involved in experiencing the uh, the video clip in the first place, that same neuron seems to fire selectively when the episode is recalled afterwards, when there's no visual stimulus there. And another thing that you may have noticed was that the cells seemed to fire just before he said the Simpsons, which might be significant because we think, of course, that our memory of the Simpsons would probably precede our ability to, to say the Simpsons. And I think we had a question from the back earlier on which I didn't answer. Did you? Um, is that the process that they go through? I mean, how do they figure out exactly what the, the neuron is doing? It's a good question. It's well worth reading the supplementary information from the original paper, if you're interested in that, the Quiroga paper. I have read it. And what I'm going to now tell you is my memory of what it says, rather than necessarily what it says. But I believe that in the morning, let's say, they go in to see the same participant who's recently had the electrodes implanted, they've recovered from the, from the implantation, um, and they're recording from those electrodes, and they will show them a whole bunch of, of pictures and find out if any of them will make the neurons in the vicinity of the, uh, of the electrodes fire. And then in the afternoon, in the Jennifer Aniston cell study, they found one that fires to Jennifer Aniston. So they've come back with like a large number of pictures of Jennifer Aniston, the Eiffel Tower, that might have made one or two of the other cells fire. And they brought them in specially to test that hypothesis in the afternoon. And it's quite, you know, it's obviously quite difficult work to do in any, in any event. Um, Yes, okay, so I should, I think, is there anything else? No, I think I'll move on to the next slide. So, we need to be a bit careful about guessing that this particular individual cell cares about the Simpsons clip. But it's interesting that the same cell that fired during the Simpsons clip, and not to other um, similarly complex visual stimuli, also fired before the patient recalls the clip in a subsequent Interview. So I would argue that it's not merely a, respo a, a response to the visual stimulus or a code for the visual stimulus, but it's actually a representation. The neural firing stands for the idea of the Simpsons. Now, I admit that this is not absolutely rock-solid evidence at this stage, but it's certainly circumstantial evidence that might make you think that neurons in this part of the brain stand for things that can happen on the outside. Um, but what are the problems with that idea? Certainly the neurons seem to be highly abstract and they tune to a complex combination of, of um, cues. So when we have a cell that fires to Jennifer Aniston, it doesn't matter whether the background's light or dark, where Jen is facing this way or that way, whether she's got her hair in tresses or whether she plaited it or anything like that. It really matters, it seems, whether it's Jennifer Aniston or not. Interestingly, I think maybe it didn't fire when Jennifer was with Brad Pitt, I think in that study you can check that one carefully, but there are some times when it didn't fire. Um, and I think at least one of the cells fired both to Jennifer and to um, the actress who plays Phoebe, whose name I've forgotten. So there's a hint in that data, and maybe in some of the other data that they've, they've discovered, that, it's, that, that these cells are not firing uniquely to a particular concept, but rather to related concepts, possibly. Um, but what are the chances in any event, and some of you will have already been thinking, what are the chances in any event of the recording electrode being next to the one cell in the brain that happens to represent Jennifer Aniston, or the Simpsons, or my granny? The chances are vanishingly small, because there are a hell of a lot of cells in your brain. Some estimates put it at, I think, 100 billion. And my electrode is only next to one of them, and it happens to be the one that measures the thing that I was looking for. The chances are so remote as to make that idea seem very unlikely. In fact, colleagues of the, the same research group, so Wado and colleagues are, are people who have analysed data from the same group, have tried to calculate what proportion of stimuli a given cell will fire to. Um, based on a number of different assumptions. You can imagine that this is a very difficult calculation to make. You need to make quite a few guesses, like how many different objects are there in the world is one of them, and it's rather difficult to guess. 
But with some reasonably sensible guesses about that type of thing, they were able to come up with an estimate that a given medial temporal lobe neuron of this type will fire to about half a percent of possible stimuli, whatever that might mean, which is um, that's half a percent. So it's a very small proportion. In other words, these cells have a very selective response. Um, but it's not quite the same as being like a grandmother cell because each cell will, it therefore means, will fire to roughly 150 to 150 distinct objects. So it's not just firing to a unique uh, object. So we've reason to believe that more than one cell uh, will fire to each stimulus. Many cells will fire to each stimulus. And that each cell will fire to many, sti many stimuli. But nonetheless, it is what we call a sparse representation. The cell is exquisitely tuned to a particular combination of, of, of inputs that define a few objects. Okay, so the second issue that I want to come on to is this puzzling thing about the, the difference, really, between um, a neuron and a smoke detector, if you like. Individual action potentials, yes, they're all or nothing events. They either happen or they don't happen. But firing rates, the rate at which these uh, events occur, are continuously variable. So the firing rate is not all or nothing. You can have a low firing rate, a medium firing rate, and a high firing rate. In fact, that's exactly what we were plotting on the tuning curves that we looked at earlier on. So if that's the case, if we think of neurons as a detector, how do we interpret these variations in the firing rate? So to make it concrete, let's imagine we've got this V1 cell that we talked about earlier on. Now that's a cell that cares about the orientation of a stimulus. Well, the firing rate seems to be the same whether the, this, the stimulus is orientated at 45 degrees this way or at 45 degrees that way. So those are two very different stimuli that are producing the same firing rate in the cell. So another way of putting it is that if the cell is firing at this rate, the stimulus is highly ambiguous. We wouldn't know from that one cell whether we were looking at an oblique line in this orientation or an oblique line in that orientation. You can do the same type of reasoning with all of the other kinds of neuron that I've mentioned today. So, for example, a head direction cell that we, remember, we talked about earlier on. Remember, I was running in this direction. Everybody was applauding wildly. I was running in this direction. Again, the applause came vigorously uh, to your hands. But, again, if the cell is firing at an intermediate rate here, um, we can't really tell which direction, from a given head direction cell, we can't really tell which direction the animal is heading in. So the individual neuron, the firing of that neuron is not unambiguous, except if it's firing really at its peak firing rate. Same thing for the motor cortex. If I've got these monkey neurons that are telling the uh, animal which direction to move its <coughs> limb, uh, if it's firing at an intermediate rate, this individual neuron can't tell the animal whether it should move its arm either of these two directions. It's that these two directions are um, 180 degrees apart. So an intermediate firing rate is, is very ambiguous in these cells. Does that make sense? Okay, so the firing rate of an individual neuron doesn't tell us about the stimulus for a sensory cell. It doesn't tell us about the cognitive parameters in the case of, say, a head direction cell or a place cell. And a single neuron can't tell us about the nature of the action that's going to be generated in the case of these motor cortical cells. Individual neurons are a bit like detectors, but they can't tell us exactly what the stimulus is like. There's some ambiguity uh, in it. If we look at this um, cartoon, it kind of illustrates this in a more abstract way. Here's the tuning curve that we talked about earlier on. Let's imagine we've got four different values of some stimulus property that we're interested in, A, B, C, and D. And here's the firing rate on the y-axis. Well, if we compare um, B to C, um, the firing rates that both um, are associated with B and C are roughly the same, so we can't really tell them apart. But even if we compare A to D, which are very far apart, we still can't tell which of those two things is happening. And in this area here, where the cell doesn't fire, we can't tell anything at all. So the individual neuron, the firing of an individual neuron, has quite a lot of ambiguity in it, in terms of, of, what the, th of the thing that it might be representing. So what do we do with that? These broad tunings, these broad bell-shaped functions, 
could be useful. They might not be entirely a bad thing. Because they mean that the cell can communicate some information even when the conditions it's looking for aren't being precisely met. Unfortunately, I've eaten my banana now. But if I had still got my banana, you would be able to recognise it from a number of different viewpoints, even including viewpoints that you hadn't encountered before. Nathan was able to recognise it as a banana, even though it was an individual banana, different from any banana that he'd ever encountered before. It's a slightly different, unique banana. We wouldn't want a neuron for every single banana or every single face, which is more realistic, that we might encounter, I suspect. We probably want to have a range of, we want to be able to get a range of responses so that a given neuron can still tell us something even when the conditions that it's looking for are not being precisely met. Okay, but by the same token, there are necessarily going to be, there's necessarily going to be some ambiguity about what's being signaled by an individual neuron at a given point in time. Um, so the firing rate of a neuron can signal the degree <coughs> to which a current um, input meets its preferred value. So if you look at this, clip, this picture of a bath tap over here, um, it's quite hard for me to see that as being a bath tap. I tend to see it as a face. And not only do I see it as a face, I actually see it as a slightly shocked looking face. But in any event, I, it, it's not hard to imagine that neurons that normally respond to faces are engaged by a stimulus that has some configurable properties in common with the face. Um, similarly, here on the right hand side, I've just got a picture of a well known uh, visual illusion. This, this uh, is clearly an apple. Uh, sorry, an apple. This is, an apple. <laughs> this is clearly, this is clearly a, a rabbit. Uh, until you look a bit harder at it and then you start thinking it might be a duck and then maybe you're thinking it's a rabbit again in a duck and it seems to sort of vary by stably between the two different things a bit like, the, a bit like uh, perhaps Marilyn Monroe and um, Josh Brolin or, or whoever he is in the previous example so neurons might need to reflect this uncertainty about the real world the real world doesn't come with certainty and our brain cells need to, res to be able to respond to, to uncertainty. And in fact, we could imagine that the neuron represents the probability to which an individual, a particular stimulus is present, or the degree to which something appears to be true, or that some action is intended. So we don't necessarily need to think about the firing rate as being like the signal emitted by a smoke detector. It can be more subtle than that, and the subtlety could actually be useful to us. So the firing rates can reflect and represent uncertainty. Okay, so that, that uh, sums it up. And in the last three slides, I think I've got a few slides just to come up before you fold your papers. Um, I'm just going to summarise what we've talked about today with the key points so that you can know which are the most important to take away with you. First of all, I said that uh, individual neurons might be thought of as being a bit like a detector. It's a useful analogy. It sends out a signal when some complicated... Uh, conditions are met um, and the firing rate is the signal that it sends out sometimes we actually also need to look at the timing of the individual spikes so that's rate coding and temporal coding um, individual neurons have tuning curves in that they and they tend to um, show systematic variations in firing rate to perhaps an aspect of the stimulus an aspect of um, a motor response or some cognitive variable. Cognitive variables are not well defined, but they could be things like location in the room or direction that you're heading in. Those are two concrete examples that I've told you about today. And individual neurons don't just have to respond to a single variable, they can respond to multiple variables. So a combination of different things needs to be true. And in some cases, that combination can be quite subtle, like the combination of different things uh, needed to define the actress Jennifer Aniston, for example, is presumably a pretty complicated combination of different properties. And we've seen at least one example of a case where a neuron fires both during the experience of a stimulus but also during um, retrieval of, of the event corresponding to that stimulus, um, which I think means that we can think about this firing rate 
um, in individual neurons as being something like a representation. The firing rate stands for the presence or the, the probability or the uh, degree to which a certain thing is out there or a certain action is going to be emitted. Uh, yes, right. So how far, I asked at the end, can we stretch the idea of the neuron as a d detector? Perhaps we're getting already to the very limits of it. Um, the limits are that we probably don't need a detector for every single concept. We don't have grandmother cells, as far as we can tell. Um, and I've talked a little bit about that today, and I'm going to tell you a bit more about it at the beginning of next week's lecture. Um, also, firing rates seem to vary systematically. They're not all or none, so they might reflect the probability or the degree to which some conditions are met. And coming with the firing rate of an individual neuron, considered on its own, there's some ambiguity. Next week, we're going to talk about how this, these limitations might be resolved uh, in multiple neurons. How is information from multiple neurons combined to represent the much richer information and to resolve ambiguity in the output of individual neurons? But until this time next week, I bid you farewell and may God go with you. necessarily tie very obviously to particular lectures, so I can't really say very much more than that. And the good thing to do would be, I think, if it was me, what I would do is, I'd listen to the lectures, I'd take notes in the lectures, I'd try to understand, and pretty much get about 80% of what you're supposed to know through that, and then I would um, read the various things after the lecture, or even after the whole course. To, to, to clarify things, it, I mean, hopefully, things like the tutorial reading, it, it makes it all very clear. So, and I will try, if I can, to identify further readings if I can see them during the course of the thing. But I haven't found anything that good yet. Okay. So but it should. I think, like I, I try to do everything in the lecture, but yeah. some some of the readings will contain the 
the way I think about it is if you're really interested in hardball exams, reading stuff helps because it doesn't matter if it's the intended or something else. You know, you might find, you might happen on something that helps you get to the correct answer more quickly and more accurately and more certainly. That gets you get through the multiple choice exam quickly. So that, it's not really a great way of thinking about how to study a course like this, as I tried to say at the beginning, you know, really want to think about understanding. And the ability to pass the exam is a byproduct of that. And I will be trying to get everybody to understand everything they need to know to pass it. Believe me, I love it when people get good marks on the exams. So just as long as we're doing the reading exam at BLA, that can't be asked about anything else that's not on the uh, Yes. So the lecture's not the most important the, the, I think I've summarised it I, clearly. If I find that there's some topic on the exam paper, which I look at occasionally, that I haven't covered, yeah. then I will try and put something right before your exam to make sure that there's at least a clue. But some of them, in order that everybody doesn't get 100%, some of them have to be pretty hard yeah. questions. So, you know, that's just the way it is. You, I try and make the questions on the things that you should most understand. You know. But we, if everybody got the top mark, the whole um, exam would be useless. Oh, oh, yeah, it was just in terms of like... No, I'm just... I'm, I've been thinking about it a lot recently, you know, it's crazy. If everybody got a really good... Yeah. So the easy, if I wanted you to get the top mark in the exam, the best thing for me to do is say, questions one to four will be covered in this two-hour lecture. Well, yeah, yeah. This is lecture one. And I go over it again and again, and I say, now, does everybody know the answer? Some people say, no, I do it again. And by that way, we'd all get 100%. The exam would be useless. The worst people in the class would do as well as the best people, and um, the whole thing would be crazy. So that's not what we do. We kind of go for it. Just because some other like strands say like you will get like two questions on every From, single reading that yeah. I give you. I haven't been. I, if I say anything about the reading, I shall say it to the whole group. Yes. But effectively, the reading is useful. Right. So I said it for a reason. I would look at it if I was you. Right. It's intended to help you with the exam. I hope that the key points are going to be covered in the lectures. Right. You'll see that when you try and do the reading, it doesn't make much sense until you've already been to the lecture. Maybe until you've been to two lectures. Right. Sorry okay. about that. Thank you. Cheers.